There's a cliche that says that the surfaces of some other planets are better known than the Earth's seabed. Well, maybe that used to be so, but we're now learning a great deal about the geology of the ocean floor. This is the story of scientific discovery about the geology of the seabed that led to the fundamental concept in Earth systems, plate tectonics. A modern map of the age of the seabed shows the story. The modern seabed has been created only over the past two to three hundred million years. It's been paved by tectonic processes. But how has this been discovered? Indeed, how do we know plate tectonics happens on Earth? The story involves many different types of information, data and ideas. And we're going to start with bathymetry. Bathymetric mapping on a global scale is only a relatively modern activity. It began by sailing ships doing soundings with weights on ropes lower to the seabed. Then, after World War II, the US Navy and Coast Guard used sonar. These sonar surveys were collated by researchers at Lamont Doherty in New York and used by Marie Tharp to draft so-called physiographic maps of the ocean basins. The raw bathymetric data themselves were a military secret, but Tharp's rather artistic maps reveal ridges and valleys, such as here in the North Central Atlantic. Her maps were picked up by others, including Bill Maynard of Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, and he published the idea of mid-ocean ridges. This is his map, which we can emphasise in colour. The ridges form a global network. The next key piece of information in our story also comes to the late 1950s and its heat flow, starting in this corner of the Pacific. A colleague of Maynard's at Scripps, Dick von Hertzen, measured heat flow in sediments on the seabed. This is his map. The data are pretty sparse, and again we can add colour. This is the morphological ridge, the East Pacific Rise, and these are von Hertzen's data high heat flow along the ridge, decaying quickly away from it. His follow-up study, published a few years later, this time with Seiya Ueda from Tokyo University, is even more striking. The lower graph is bathymetry, the top one is heat flow, and the coincidence of high heat flow with the ridge crest is clear. So now we come to Harry Hess at Princeton. He picked up on Maynard's interpretation of Tharp's mapping and von Hertzen's heat flows and proposed that mid-ocean ridges were sites of mantle upwelling, convection currents that flowed away from ridges and which must return to depth somewhere else. This is seafloor spreading, a fundamental component of what would later be pulled into the notion of plate tectonics. This is Hess in the mid-60s explaining his ideas. But the term seafloor spreading was actually coined by Bob Deitz in 1961, though there was some controversy about whether he picked this up from lectures and discussions with Hess before Hess's publication. Let's briefly return to Mary Tharp's map. Her key involvement in these discoveries was only recognised decades after their publication and interpretation. Such was the chauvinism at the time. But she recognised the tectonic significance of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and indeed other parts of the global ridge system. So the seafloor spreading hypothesis, commonly credited to Hess, very much is the product of several individuals. The Atlantic Ocean has opened over geological time. But in 1960, this was only a hypothesis and indeed not a very popular one. More information was needed. So it's time to introduce another player in our story. Ron Mason, a British geophysicist at Imperial College who spent long sabbaticals at Scripps, his mission was to map the magnetic field over the oceans. Actually, the interest was in the magnetic anomalies, variations away from the Earth's ambient magnetic field that portray geological features. Or, in the case of the US Navy and Coast Guard who funded this work, the possible presence of Soviet submarines. Mason's results were astounding. The magnetic anomalies were arranged in long linear features, 
offset occasionally by faults as here, what we now know today as the Murray Fracture Zone or Transform Fault. With his research funds, Mason employed Art Raff, a technical assistant at Scripps, to deploy magnetometers at sea. And so it was this work that first showed the magnetic stripes. The famous study was in the Northeast Pacific, published in 1960. This is the conventionally contoured map made by Art Raff. Though this version brings out the features, Ron Mason shaded the anomalies with values above his baseline value and left those below white. This zebra pattern changed the world. The features aligned with the bathymetric ridges but had themselves no morphological expression. They were tracking the magnetic properties of the seabed. So what is the meaning of the zebra pattern? Well, almost as soon as Raff and Mason published their maps, Lawrence Morley, a Canadian geologist, twigged. For him, the magnetic stripes represented reversals of the Earth's magnetic field recorded in the rocks and that the seabed moving away from the ridges was varied in age. He tried to publish, but repeatedly his manuscript was rejected by journals. The idea was just too revolutionary. Indeed, the idea that the Earth's magnetic field had reversed polarity through time was barely accepted by anybody in the early 1960s. For many, the zebra stripes were errors in the survey, some kind of instrument malfunction. And so Morley barely features in accounts at the time. So rather, our story moves on to 1963 and to a less sceptical group of scientists at the University of Cambridge. It was here that Fred Vine was starting his PhD under the supervision of Drum Matthews. His project to understand the magnetic signature of the seabed. And Vine and Matthews published in 1963 what is now the classic interpretation. Magnetic stripes are indeed the record of alternating reversals of the Earth's magnetic field, a tape recorder of tectonics. This is the record of seafloor spreading. But in 1963, just like Morley earlier, Vine and Matthews encountered few fans of their hypothesis. Then, in the following year, came this paper by a group of paleomagnetists, led by Alan Cox, showing that indeed the Earth's magnetic field reverses polarity from time to time. They measured the polarity of the remnant magnetism recorded in lavas from various sites around the world. And they had these lavas radiometrically dated using the then novel potassium argon technique. And these are the results. Regardless of where the lavas were measured, they showed a magnetic polarity that changed with age. It's a hugely powerful tool for calibrating stratigraphy, even today, and established what is now known as the geomagnetic polarity timescale. So let's go back to Fred Vine. By 1966, he's finished his PhD and can put together the story. Vine wanted to use the magnetic reversals running out from ridges as tape recorders of spreading rates. So here's the data from the Juan de Fuca Ridge in the Northeast Pacific. Black bars represent normal magnetic polarities as today, and the white ones are reversed. Now, some geologists, while accepting that reversals of the Earth's magnetic field happen, believe that these reversals happened regularly, like some internal Earth clock. So we can explore this idea by laying the reversals out, each representing the same amount of geological time. We don't know what that time period is, but for now it doesn't matter. The important thing is that each interval has the same duration. So cross-plotting the reversal events in time against their width on the ground, normal and reverse and back again, shows this, which implies that the rate of seafloor spreading is sometimes fast, the steep bits of the curve, and sometimes slow. With this calibration, the seafloor spreading, along with any driving mantle convection, would be jerky, which just doesn't seem very likely for deep earth flow. So let's build in as Fred Fine did, the breaking results from the magnetic stratigraphy world and this global calibration. 
So rather than this, we can plot the time axis like this and now plot the data. And wonderfully, the spreading rates for the Juan de Fuca Ridge are just about constant through time, at least for the last four million years, at a rate of 2.9 centimetres a year. Actually, it's the half spreading rate as we're only plotting one side of the ridge. The rate of new plate creation at Juan de Fuca is 5.8 centimetres per year. And it's been like this for the past four million years. And Vine did the same plotting exercise for other ridges. Here, the East Pacific rise. Again, a remarkably simple, steady seafloor spreading rate, but at the faster rate of 4.4 centimetres a year, or 8.8 .8 for the full seafloor spreading rate. So, steady seafloor spreading. It's the magnetic reversals that are haphazard in time. And here's Fred Vine's published diagram from 1966, showing what we've just animated. Seafloor spreading has passed the test and has continued past all tests to this day. It's a really robust model and is the cornerstone of plate tectonics. So let's just consider this scientific history. We began with the physiographic maps created by Mary Tharp and added the heat flow data of Dick von Herzen. And it was just the first sets of these results that inspired Hess and Dates to propose seafloor spreading. But at this stage, it only had the status of a hypothesis and one that was far from universally accepted. For that acceptance, it needed the magnetic anomaly maps. We've looked at the two early ones, but later ones from the Southern Ocean and the Atlantic really sealed the deal. Although Lawrence Morley got the idea that magnetic stripes were a powerful test of seafloor spreading, it's generally credited to Vine and Matthews in 1963 as the key publication. But actually it wasn't that accepted either at the time. No, the final piece of the evidence jigsaw comes from the demonstration of the global geomagnetic field reversals coupled with their calibration in time. It was this that allowed Fred Vine to finally cement seafloor spreading as a robust model. The game continued with stunning magnetic stripes mapped out across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and hence this now classical cartoon summary of the pattern. It's this that we find in textbooks today. And so back to Raff and Mason's classic zebra stripes. Fred Vine calibrated these against the geomagnetic polarity timescale, effectively mapping out the age of the seabed in the Northeast Pacific. So this is the story of the discovery of seafloor spreading, the geological creation of the world's ocean basins. By way of postscript, we can bring our story right up to date. Here's the modern map of the age of the seabed, a continuation of the approach used by Fred Vine. And another perspective, a dramatic view of plate tectonics and its tape recorder oceans. Now we can do far more than Fred Vine did back in the 60s and quantify rates of seafloor spreading all around the world and see just how variable they can be. What a ride. But this video has only shown the beginning. What is the geological structure? What is actually going on with the seafloor? Well, that's for part two of this story.